Hello, and welcome back to the Poetry Podcast with me, Lance Pearson. In this programme, we come by a listener's request to one of the undoubted peaks of English literature, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. It will take the whole of this podcast and starts an occasional strand of single, longer poems rather than several shorter ones. There is nothing quite like it, before or since. And yet it is Coleridge's late 18th century romantic take on the world of the ancient medieval ballads. It has their spellbinding rhythm and some of their language. And that's partly why the rhyme of the title is spelt R-I-M-E, not the modern R-H. Y M E. To Coleridge, a major thinker and writer, fascinated by new psychological insights, the mariner is modern man forced to expiate his load of guilt in the lonely expanses of his soul. He was only twenty five when he wrote it, and at a reasonably contented stage of life. As the youngest of ten sons, and his parents' favourite, he had some experience of family alienation, but it was as if the poem took him through the later struggles of his life in advance. The achievement is all the more remarkable for such a young man. This is the second time I have recorded this poem. The first was over 50 years ago when I was at school, aged 16, studying Coleridge and Wordsworth's lyrical ballads for A-levels. I had been given a tape recorder and couldn't resist trying my voice on this beguiling poem. But then I thought it was just a weird psychedelic nightmare with no connection to the present day. I feel very differently now. It seems alarmingly prophetic of global warming, with the ocean dying under a toxic curse. Everything goes wrong when the mariner upsets the world's biodiversity by shooting the albatross. The curse is lifted when he learns to love and respect the whole of nature. More than that, and this isn't often recognised, The poem is a story of Christian conversion, like that of the prodigal son. The mariner sets out from home and loses himself somewhere after rounding the South Pole and drifting towards the equator. Salvation comes when he finds himself able to love God's creation again. In the medieval Catholic language of the ballads, Angels and demons and spirits and the Virgin Mary, penance and confession to a hermit, bring him home to tell his story. There is perhaps an autobiographical element here. Coleridge was a convinced, if rather unorthodox, Christian, and he had a notorious compulsion to talk and talk and talk. There are different voices in the poem, the mariner, the wedding guest, the spectral visions and voices, the hermit, the pilot and his boy. In our local poetry group we have read it dramatised, and I would love to turn it into a poetic symphony with music and sound effects. But as it is the story of a lone man's pilgrimage, perhaps it is appropriate on this occasion to perform it with a single reader. Coleridge tells the story in seven parts, each of which ends at a dramatic moment. I shall say when we reach the end of each part, in case you want to pause and take a break. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three by thy long grey beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stopst thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear 
Ah, the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, greybeard loon. Eftsoons his hand dropped he. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbour cleared, merrily did we drop below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright, and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon. The wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose is she, nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. The wedding guest he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his o'ertaking wings, and chased us south along, with sloping masts and dipping prow, as who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe, and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold, and ice, mast high, came floating by, and green as emerald. And through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen, nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken, the ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swoon. At length did cross an albatross. Through the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul. We hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit. The helmsman steered us through, and a good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow, and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hello. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine, whilst all the night through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why look'st thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. End of part one. The sun now rose upon the right, out of the sea came he, still hid in mist, and on the left went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work him woe, for all averred I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay, that made the breeze to blow. Nor dim, nor red, like God's own head, the glorious sun uprist. Then all averred I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. Twas right, said they, such birds to slay, that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down. Twas sad as sad could be, and we did speak only to 
break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath, nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O oh, Christ, that ever this should be, ye slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burnt green and blue and white. And some in dreams ashore it were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow, and every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak, no more than if we had been choked with soot. Ah, oh, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. End of part two. There passed a weary time. Each throat was parched and glazed each eye. A weary time, a weary time, how glazed each weary eye, when looking westward, I beheld a something in the sky. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved and took at last a, a certain shape, I wist. A speck, a mist, a shape, I wist, and still it neared and neared, as if it dodged a water sprite. It plunged and tacked and veered. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could nor laugh nor wail. Through utter drought, all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried, A sail, a sail! With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, agape they heard me call. Gramercy! They for joy did grin, and all at once their breath drew in, as they were drinking all. See, see, I cried, she tacks no more, hither to work as wheel. Without a breeze, without a tide, she steadies with upright keel. The western wave was all aflame, the day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun. When that strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun, and straight the sun was flecked with bars, Heaven's mother send us grace, as if through a dungeon grate he peered, with broad and burning face. Alas, thought I, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun, like restless gossamers? Are those her ribs through which the sun did peer as through a grate? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? And are there two? Is, is death that woman's mate? Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold. Her skin was as white as leprosy. The nightmare, life in death, 
was she who thicks men's blood with cold. The naked hug alongside came, and the twain were casting dice. The game is done! I've won! I've won! quoth she, and whistles thrice. The sun's rim dips, the stars rush out. At one stride comes the dark, with far-heard whisper o'er the sea, off shot the spectre bark. We listened and looked sideways up, fear at my heart, as at a cup my life-blood seemed to sip. The stars were dim and thick the night, the steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white, from the sails the dew did drip. Till clomb above the eastern bar, the horned moon, with one bright star, within the nether tip. One after one, by the star-dogged moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang, and cursed me with his eye. Four times fifty living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan. With heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down, one by one. The souls did from their bodies fly, they fled to bliss or woe, and every soul it passed me by. Like the whiz of my crossbow. End of part three. I fear thee, ancient mariner, I fear thy skinny hand, and thou art long and lank and brown as is the ribbed sea-sand. I fear thee, and thy glittering eye, and thy skinny hand so brown. Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest. This body dropped not down. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on. And so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea, and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids and kept them close, and the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye. And the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs. Nor rot nor reek did they, The look with which they looked on me Had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell A spirit from on high, But, oh, more horrible than that Is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up, and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main, like April hoar-frost spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt all way, 
a still and awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck, so free the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. End of part four. Oh, sleep, it is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. To Mary, Queen, the praise be given. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. The silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained, I dreamt that they were filled with dew. And when I awoke, it rained. My lips were wet, my throat was cold, my garments all were dank. Sure I had drunken in my dreams, and still my body drank. I moved and could not feel my limbs. I was so light, almost I thought that I had died in sleep and was a blessed ghost. And soon I heard a roaring wind. It did not come anear, but with its sound it shook the sails that were so thin and sere. The upper air burst into life, and a hundred fire flags sheen. To and fro they were hurried about, and to and fro and in and out the one stars danced between. And the coming wind did roar more loud, and the sails did sigh like sedge, and the rain poured down from one black cloud. The moon was at its edge. The thick black cloud was cleft, and still the moon was at its side, like waters shot from some high crag. The lightning fell with never a jag, a river steep and wide. The loud wind never reached the ship, yet now the ship moved on. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, nor spake, nor moved their eyes. It had been strange, even a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blew. The mariners all gan work the ropes where they were wont to do. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. The body of my brother's son stood by me, knee to knee. The body and I pulled at one rope, but he said naught to me. I, I fear thee, ancient mariner. Be calm, thou wedding guest. T'was not those souls that fled in pain, which to their courses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. For when it dawned, they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths, and from their bodies passed. Around, around flew each sweet sound, then darted to the sun. Slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Sometimes a dropping from the sky, I heard the skylark sing. Sometimes all little birds that are, how they seemed to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. And now twas like all instruments, now like a lonely flute. And now it is an angel's song that makes the heavens be mute. Oh, it ceased. Yet still the sails made on a pleasant noise till noon, a noise like of a hidden brook in the leafy month of June, that to the sleeping woods all night 
singeth a quiet tune. Till noon we quietly sailed on, yet never a breeze did breathe. Slowly and smoothly went the ship, moved onward from beneath. Under the keel, nine fathom deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left off their tune, and the ship stood still also. The sun, right up above the mast, had fixed her to the ocean, but in a minute she gan stir with a short, uneasy motion, backwards and forwards, half her length, with a short, uneasy motion. Then, like a pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound. It flung the blood into my head, and I fell down in a swoon. How long in that same fit I lay, I, I have not to declare. But ere my living life returned, I heard, and in my soul discerned, two voices in the air. Is it he? quoth one. Is this the man? By him who died on cross, with his cruel bow he laid full low the harmless albatross. The spirit who bideth by himself in the land of mist and snow, he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. The other was a softer voice, a soft as honeydew, quoth he. The man hath penance done, and penance more will do. End of part five. But tell me, tell me, speak again, thy soft response renewing. What makes that ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? Still as a slave before his lord, the ocean hath no blast. His great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast, if he may know which way to go, for she guides him, smooth or grim. See, brother, see, how graciously she looketh down on him. But why drives on that ship so fast, without all wave or wind? The air is cut away before, and closes from behind. Fly, brother, fly, more high, more high, or we shall be belated for slow and slow that ship will go when the mariner's trance is abated. I awoke, and we were sailing on as in a gentle weather. T'was night, calm night, the moon was high. The dead men stood together, all stood together on the deck for a charnel dungeon fitter. All fixed on me their stony eyes That in the moon did glitter. The pang, the curse with which they died, Had never passed away. I could not draw my eyes from theirs, Nor turn them up to pray. And now this spell was snapped, Oh, once more I viewed the ocean green, and looked far forth, yet little sore of what had else been seen, like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. But soon there breathed a wind on me, nor sound nor motion made. Its path was not upon the sea, in ripple or in shade. It raised my hair, it fanned my cheek, like a meadow gale of spring. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet she sailed softly too. Sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze on me alone. It blew. Oh, dream of joy! Is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this mine own country? 
we drifted o'er the harbour bar, and I with sobs did pray, Oh, let me be awake, my God, or let me sleep alway. The harbour bay was clear as glass, so smoothly it was strewn, and on the bay the moonlight lay, and the shadow of the moon. The rock shone bright, the kirk no less, that stands above the rock, the moonlight steeped in silentness, the steady weathercock. And the bay was white with silent light, till rising from the same, full many shapes that shadows were, in crimson colours came. A little distance from the prow those crimson shadows were, I turned my eyes upon the deck. Oh, Christ, what saw I there? Each corpse lay flat, lifeless and flat, and by the holy rood, a man all light, a seraph man, on every corpse there stood. This seraph band, each waved his hand. It was a heavenly sight. They stood as signals to the land, each one a lovely light. This seraph band, each waved his hand. No voice did they impart, no voice. But, oh, the silence sank like music on my heart. But soon I heard the dash of oars. I heard the pilot's cheer. My head was turned perforce away, and I saw a boat appear. The pilot and the pilot's boy. I heard them coming fast. Dear Lord in heaven, it was a joy the dead men could not blast. I saw a third. I heard his voice. It is the hermit good. He singeth loud his godly hymns that he makes in the wood. He'll shrive my soul, he'll wash away the albatross's blood. End of part six. This hermit good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he rears, he loves to talk with marineers that come from a far country. He kneels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared. I heard them talk. Why, this is strange, I trow. Where are those lights so many and fair? The signal made, but now. Strange by my faith, the hermit said. And they answered not our cheer. The planks looked warped, and see those sails, how thin they are and sere. I never saw aught like to them, unless perchance it were brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along. When the ivy tod is heavy with snow, and the owl that whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young. Dear Lord, it hath a fiendish look. The pilot made reply, I am afeard. Push on, push on, said the hermit cheerly. The boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down. Like lead, stunned by that loud and dreadful sound, which sky and ocean smote, like one that hath been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. But swift as dreams, myself I found within the pilot's boat, upon the whirl where sank the ship, the boat spun round and round, and all was still save that the hill was telling of the sound. I moved my lips. The pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. I took the oars. The pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go, laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha-ha! 
quoth he, full plain I see, the devil knows how to row. And now all in my own country I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. Oh, shrive me, shrive me, holy man. The hermit crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? Forthwith this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale. And then it left me free. Since then, at an uncertain hour, that agony returns, until my ghastly tale is told. This heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him my tale I teach. What loud uproar bursts from that door? The wedding guests are there, but in the garden bower the bride and bridesmaids singing are. And hark the little vesper bell which biddeth me to prayer. O oh, wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company. To walk together to the kirk and all together pray while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well, who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best, who loveth best all things, both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone. And now the wedding guest, turned from the bridegroom's door, he went like one that hath been stunned, and is of sense forlorn, a sadder and a wiser man. He rose. The morrow morn. Well, that's all for now. If you've a request for a poem you'd like me to read, please leave a comment at the website, the Poetry Podcast with LancePearson.com, or on our YouTube page. Next time, we shall have more Coleridge and from his fellow romantic poet, William Wordsworth.